Hi, this is Silver Ring Running Cloud with What It Takes to Be Great. Today we're interviewing Theodore Colbert, a Northwestern University graduate in biology. And today Theodore uh, had a wonderful career in sales. He still sells now with True Green, and he's a man who had a calling and followed it. Hi, Ted, how are you today? Hey, Lita, how are you? I haven't seen you in about however long it was, 70s, what is this? What was it, 71, 72, 73, something like that? It's we, been a while. Yeah. It's been a while. But you look the same, Theodore, and you're talking. Well, you, you don't look like your 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 age. You you got to be about the same age I am, and you don't look it at all. Well, neither do you. I think we just are just a bunch of good-looking, young-looking older <laughs> people, you know, like young seniors here, you know. So so that's a wonderful thing. So I have just a few questions for you today. So I'm gonna put you put you on the spot. Um, I'm gonna start just talking a little bit about uh, being at Northwestern. And, and how you felt about being at Northwestern, what your major was, and if you had any professors that you liked. Um, as I mentioned, I, my major was biological sciences because, like I said, I originally was, was, uh, was going to be a doctor. Okay, I wanted to go into internal medicine originally. And some of the things that stand out in my mind was, our, that was, as you remember, that was right in the middle of the black recruitment time. The schools were trying to get black people, remember? And when I came there, everybody wanted to be a doctor. Okay, Every, everybody. Right? Uh, I know, we were all trained to want to be a doctor or a lawyer. So I was in organic chemistry, and it was almost all black people in there. And I think only two of us or three of us that took that first original big organic chemistry class. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think only three of us graduated in biology. Yeah, it was rough. The competition was really rough. So the, I think the first thing, Lisa, that stands out in my mind was how I got to Northwestern, okay? I really saw the providence of the Lord because I happened to have been born during that time so that when I got to be like 18 or so, it was right in the height of the let's get black folks in school, okay? Yeah. And, was, and as you remember, there were a ton of black people. Early affirmative action. Exactly. If you remember, there were a ton of us at, 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 at Northwestern during that, that time. Just, and for what I understand, two or three years earlier, there weren't hardly any black people there. That, that, that happened because of that black recruitment thing that we happened, that the Lord providentially happened to have put us in the middle of, which is, which is probably why, even though I graduated fourth in a class of 425, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I graduated, and, and I was in the, you know, the major work in advanced placement program, all, all that kind of stuff. But even though I had great grades and all that kind of stuff, I still wonder if I would have gotten into a school like Northwestern had they not had that affirmative action program. I see. Well, you know, one way to look at that, Theodore, is to think that there would be no need for affirmative action if you had gotten an equal education in the first place. So with your level of intelligence to, to, to you know, to come for us to come from behind is socially not, not from private schools, but from public schools and not from any public schools, but from racially segregated public schools because they desegregated during our era, didn't they? They did. But let me tell you something else that's kind of interesting. Um, like I said, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and they had a couple particular schools that the quote unquote intelligent black kids went to. I had to catch two to three buses. I went to a school called Collinwood High School. And that was a school that had the advanced placement program set up. And most of us little black kids from the inner city, we had to catch two or three buses to get from the inner city to Collinwood High School. I think a that's a trauma. You know, so we, we all got bussed out. In fact, I got bussed out from a better school system to an inferior school system. Really? How that happened? And I had to see striking parents on my on my way to school. I had to see angry, striking parents with signs. So wow. they took me to a, le a lesser school and traumatized me. It was very traumatic. Their attempts. Well, well I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Now I was in my school, 
Collinwood High School was very racially segregated, as you mentioned. There were a lot of Italians, and a lot of us black kids were bust in, okay? And the Italians didn't like us. And my school was on Huntley Brinkley. You remember Huntley and Brinkley? Sure. My school was was nationally known because my school was on Huntley and Brinkley for race riots. Oh, my God. National. Nationally known for race riots. There were three or four times where I was running for my life. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see? Now, that kind of trauma, that kind of trauma affects a person's ability to to learn. I agree. So so I do think, in answer to your question that we had this little, long little discussion about, but in answer to your question, I do believe that you would have still experienced greatness and success at Northwestern not been having affirmative action. Um, Did you have any favorite professors at school? There was a guy, and I can't remember his name. It was a it was a C level biology course, and I can't remember his name. Uh, and I took three or four courses from him, and he thought that I was, you know, he thought very highly of me and everything with the with the with the biology stuff. I can't remember his name though. But uh, and he uh, wrote a recommendation from me from from medical school, but I can't remember his name. Wow. Do you think there was racism on campus when we were there? Oh sure, sure. Did you experience any yourself? Did you want to talk? Yeah, you can mention. There was was racism, but I think, I mean, I didn't have any problems. I didn't have any problems with racism, but it was definitely there. And there were a lot of, you remember, there were a lot of angry young black kids at at Northwestern during that time. We had the black house and we had the, the, you know, a lot of the, black organizations and things going on. And you know, I wasn't one of those angry kids, but there were a lot of angry black kids at Northwestern, you know, if you think back, when, when we were there. Yeah, we were the generation right after Huey Newton and all those yeah. uh, civil rights uh, leaders. And yeah. to come here. Well, well, Teddy, let me ask you, when you graduated, you went into pharmace- pharmaceutical sales. Pharmaceutical sales, yes. How did you get get from biology to pharmaceutical sales? Did they recruit well, you? Well, well, there's a biological link because, you know, biology is life science and medicine deals with life science. So what the pharmaceutical sales people did, most of the time when I talk to people about it, they'll remember people in suits coming into the doctor's office with a little, with a little black bag. That's what I did. So what I, and the reason I got into it, like I mentioned earlier, I went to the black house one day and they had, under biological sciences, the only vocational thing that they had that they was pharmaceutical sales, okay? And, you know, so I say, so you have the pharmacology and all that type of thing. And that's a good major to have to go into pharmaceutical sales, is biology. That's true, that's true. And uh, that was how- You won awards too, right? Yeah, that was how I got into it. I tell you this, this is kind of interesting. Um, um, when I interviewed, the company was originally called USV Pharmaceuticals, United States Vitamin. They morphed and wound up being, um, I, the name will come back to me, but originally we, we were called US Vitamin. And when I interviewed, the first time, and I was young and I wasn't thinking. Um, I had like three or four interviews. I had like three or four interviews. And then I wound up, before they hired me, um, they, um, I was interviewed by the regional manager. I remember the, him, his name was George Slavens. And this is an example of racism that you wouldn't even think about. So he, intro- he introduced himself to me and he looked at my, at my uh, transcripts and stuff. He said, you graduated from Northwestern? Oh my God, no, he didn't. Yes, he did. He said, you graduated from Northwestern with these grades? Oh, but wait, I'm not, I'm not to the best part yet, listen. After he said, you graduated from Northwestern with those grades, he looked at me and he smiled and he said, do you have any friends? So oh what he did, he put me in a little niche like I'm a special kind of black kid that can do that, that that well at one of the best institutions in the in the world, then maybe I got some more friends like me. And I didn't realize how racist that was till I got older. 
Wow, that really is racist. Yeah, it really is. But because what he was trying to say was, at least mm -hmm. they were looking for us back then. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, now we're more likely to be at the end of a gun. You know, <laughs> gun, so I, I would welcome affirmative action back. Yeah, I'm telling you. Well, well so, Teddy, um, you know, Ward is a salesman, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. that's you, you know that's exciting because. In medical school, you would never have had the chance to be the kind of a social person that You're you right. could be as a salesman. And to be You're a right. successful salesman takes an especially gregarious, confident, outgoing kind of a man. So how did you win these awards? What did okay. it take to be a great salesman? First, okay. tell us the name of your awards and how'd you win them? Okay. Um, this is going to sound funny, but... In reality, even though I preach and you see the videos and you know I look all vivacious and all that kind of stuff, underneath all this is a person who was introverted. Okay, now I I kind of gotten past that obviously, but I grew up introverted, and I never would have thought that I would have wound up doing some of the things that the Lord blessed me to do because, you know, I kind of become more outgoing, but inside there. In, in the inside of Teddy is still a little bit of the introverted thing, but I kind of got past it. So I started, when I started selling the pharmaceuticals, I followed a guy who was a black guy too. And he, and see in pharmaceutical sales, you get a company car, you get an expense account, you get all that stuff, okay? And a lot of people, were looking for something like that because they wanted to be lazy. Because see, you, you can work a pharmaceutical sales job like that for a year and never go to work because you never had to, you you weren't um, punching the time clock. You were totally on your own. It was autonomous. So you had to be a go-getter. You had to get up, go out every day and talk to those doctors. Okay? And they finally kept that. They catch up with you later when the, when, the, when the numbers were horrible. And the guy that I took over from that they fired was just like that. He never worked. They, and so they hired me. And what I found was when I went out there and started working hard, Lita, I found a whole territory's worth of doctors that USV knew nothing about. Wow. I found, I found 500 doctors, 500 hundred doctors. You personally contacted 500 doctors. Oh, I contacted them twice that, but I, I'm, I'm talking about because um, the guy that worked before me never worked. You know, new doctors are moving in all the time. So I started working and I added 500 doctors to, to the universe of doctors in my territory. They had to double the, they had to hire another rep. Wow, Teddy, that's amazing. They had the eyes, so they, bro they, 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 they broke up my territory into north and south. Okay? Wow, two territories for one it was, it was two territories worth of doctors, but the guy that worked before me, his name was Harry Davies. He, he didn't work. So I went to work, and I found all these doctors, and I put them in our universe, and they had to make another territory. So... What, and what I did, Lisa, really what I did was they always said that 80% of the doctors, uh, the 20% of doctors write 80% of, of the prescriptions, okay? That's, why, that's been a whole, an old adage in pharmaceutical sales for years, okay? So what I did, and I was, a, I was also a sales trainer. Um, I trained a couple of the three, I can remember three of the best people that, that we had, I trained them. Wow. So, so um, what I did was I saw my doctors, I, I worked real hard, but I really targeted those, the biggest prescribers. They had a way of, of seeing which doctors wrote the most prescriptions. Oh yeah. Okay. And normally you would see doctors maybe six times a year. The big ones, I saw them 25 times a year. I was in their office all the time. Wow. Because, because they were the big writers. The, the Holy Ghost kind of showed me that. And so I was, and so all the big writers, I was in their office. They, they knew me, Ted, how you doing? I was in there all the time. And the other people didn't do that. The Holy Ghost showed me that. 
So I was calling on these doctors. And so you're in the faces of the huge writers all the time. They prescribe for you. Because I'm in there, I'm in there, you know, five times more than other reps are. So that was part of the thing that helped me to, to become successful. The other thing that helped me was because I went to Northwestern, as you did, and I had a degree in biology, I had an ascent towards pharmacology and that type of stuff. So what I did, I talked to the doctors about pharmacokinetics. I talked to the doctors scientifically, okay? I see. And that was, and they liked to talk to me. And I had so many doctors that were angry with me talking about, you are brilliant. What are you doing? They call us detail man. What are you doing being a detail man? You're brilliant. You know, so. How did that make you feel? Did that make uh, you feel a little, I don't know, that they didn't appreciate what you had achieved? No, they appreciate so it. sort of arrogant of those doctors to think that their job was the only job, you know? Yeah. They really thought, that, I guess maybe, they knew I was a really good salesman, okay? Because I, I yeah. think creating a brand new sales territory is the kind of pioneering maverick stuff that truly great leaders do. Well, thank you. Uh, if you are but a doctor, the doctors, really but the doctors the maybe they were a little arrogant, you know, because I think that they were thinking that, what I did was nothing in comparison to what they do because they're, they're what I did. and then they have no appreciation for what it takes to be responsible for developing a brand new sales territory. Is yep. that why you got the awards? You got two or three awards? Did you get so what happened was, and this is something that I'm, I really give God glory for. I'm really, I'm really proud of. I worked for USV for eight years. Okay. And they had never had a president's club award before. The President's Club Award, most companies have them. But the reason why I'm really thank, thank God about this one was because this was the first time that they had the President's Club. So I'm a charter member of, their, of the President's Club with USV. Uh, there were only eight of us. And normally, when they put you in the President's Club, Club it was for one outstanding year. But when you were in the when you were a charter member of the President's Club, it was for your whole career. So what they said when they made me, and I was, of course, I was the only black face, of course, of the eight of us. And they always kept banging toward us that you all don't realize what this means. This, is, this wasn't just one great year. This was for you, in your case, it was eight great years, one after the other. And so they made me a charter member of the President's Club. They gave me what they call an Atmos clock. I should have brought it in here. It's a, it's a gold color clock and it runs on atmospheric pressure changes. So you never have to set it. It just runs on the changes of the atmospheric pressure. That is really impressive, Teddy. That and they call it an Atmos clock, okay? Atmos clock. So, so, um, and they made you a charter member of the President's Award, and it was the first President's Award ever in the ever. history of that in, in, in history of wow. that country. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Then, then, uh, then about, I don't know, 10 years, 10 years later, I won my second President's Club Award. And that was the year that they had the, um, that they had the Olympics in Atlanta, in, here in the U.S. You, you may remember that, okay? I do, I do remember. So, uh, my wife and I went on the trip, and we were chauffeur-driven everywhere. Wow. We went to anything, we spent no money, they spent $100,000 on us, on each one of us. What? We went to the finest restaurants, we were chauffeur-driven everywhere, it was really nice, and it was really nice because we could go, we, wherever we wanted to go in the Olympics, we could go. So we saw the races, we saw the sprints, we saw the basketball, we saw all that stuff. You got the total VIP treatment, and that yeah. was a prize for being. Yeah, for the second, for the, you know, for the, for the second President's Club, Club Award. And it was great because we didn't spend a penny. And you got Lisa, the VIP treatment. Lisa, Lisa they spent a hundred thousand dollars on each one of us a hundred thousand dollars wow 
that means that you made a whole lot more than that for them. Oh, did, yeah. Did you go to any spas? Did you get any spa treatments while you were there? Oh, I don't remember. We, we may have gone somewhere like this. It was so long ago, I don't remember. Oh, my goodness. Well, so, Patty, aside from perseverance, you know, keep going back. Didn't people hurt your feelings? I mean, like, what excuses did you make up for, you know, didn't you feel? Actually, actually, Letha, uh -huh. for some odd reason, people like me. They've all people have always liked me. It's true. It's true. Just not in now, but people have people just like me. Like, so, so my doctors didn't get angry with me for seeing them like a hundred times or whatever. They liked it, and they saw what was happening. And, like I said, I was seeing them way more than the other guys were, and they liked my my personality and they liked the fact they they kept telling me that they thought I was so smart. Okay. Do you think you have charisma? Would you say you have? Charisma? I guess. I guess. I guess. Whenever right. something. Whenever something goes on around with, with the household, we, we've kind of decided that I should go and talk to the people because oh <laughs> people just seem to, well, I don't know. I don't, really don't know why. Um, but I guess it's just something that guys kind of put in me. People just like me. Yeah. What was your favorite part of that farm and pharmaceutical sales? Welcome back. We're here with part two of What It Takes to Be Great, an interview with Theodore Colbert. Um, Teddy, we were talking about what it takes to be a great salesman. Um, so would you tell us, uh, you said charisma and persistence, um, but it, it, does it, did, did you require courage to keep going out, putting yourself out there, being an introvert now? Yeah. Um, most of my physicians really liked me, but there were a few. They were just mean and very difficult to, to, to get along with. There was one particular physician. Um, he used our competitor's antihypertensive medic medication a lot. He, he, he liked it, and he didn't like ours. And he was always mean to the salespeople. And I called on him for years, and he was always mean. He snapped at me, and a couple of times he... He kept saying, I'm, I'm never going to use your, your product. Why do you keep coming? I don't like it. <laughs> he kept saying that. But you know what? I kept coming anyway. Okay? For years, I let that man abuse me. Okay? One day, I came in after I don't know how many years of calling on this guy. And, I, and, and I'm going to be honest with you. There were several times I just said, you know what? I'm just going to take him off, off, my, off my list of people. Because I'll never, you know, he doesn't like me and he doesn't like anybody, you know. So, because a lot of the salespeople just stopped seeing him because he was that kind of guy. How um, come you didn't? How come you didn't? What made you, what went through your mind that made you know not to give up and not to just be beaten down? What made it so you could look at the big picture and, and deal with that kind of abuse? I guess it's just kind of the way God kind of made me. Um, my mother was a very strong-willed woman who um, was kind of difficult to get along with, okay? And so having lived with her all my life, <laughs> um, I, knew, I kind of knew how to, deal with, how to deal with more difficult types of people. So one day, I walk into the office, you know, and I had to get my mind in the proper position to even go see this guy because he was that kind of man. So I took a deep breath. I said, oh, well, here we go again. So I walked in the office one day and he smiled at me for the first time in I don't know how many years. He said, Ted, he called me by my first name. I didn't think he even knew my first name. He smiled at me. He said, I treated you like a dog. He said, just like I treated all the other sales reps. And he said, but you kept coming wow. for all these years. And you know what he did? No. He started using my product. And he was one of the biggest prescribers in the whole city. And he said, and the reason why I did it, Ted, he said, you kept coming. You, you wouldn't give up? He said, he, wow. he said, everybody else did. But you kept coming. And you were nice to me. And you kept coming. I was mean to you. You always smiled. You said, yes, sir, no, sir. And that was one of the ways that I got one of the biggest prescribers 
in the city. Wow. Another interesting scenario, there was a doctor, his name was Dr. Keith Knapp. He was the biggest prescriber in the state, not just Chicago, but the whole state of Illinois. Okay. He was another real mean guy. You, the only, he wouldn't even see you. You had to see him. His, his office hours were from six at night to three in the morning. What? That's insane. Yeah, that's what I said. So, <laughs> so the only way you could talk to Dr. Knapp was you had to go in his office at like midnight or 11.30 or one o'clock. So I what I did, this is so essential. What I did, I wasn't married yet. I came home, ate dinner, took a nap, maybe watched a little television and set my alarm clock for 11.30, 12 o'clock midnight. I got back up put my suit back on, got in my company car, and drove to 29th and Wallace to see Dr. Keith Knapp. Well, now, Teddy, nobody made you do this, and nobody followed behind you to make sure you... you no, did. there was nothing. This job was totally autonomous. That's how come it was... These type of jobs aren't for a lot of people. These type of sales jobs so aren't did for... did you do it for the money? Like, when no, you're no, no, going to no, go no, out no. there, and you're going to... I was did... the money motivating you? No, no, not at all. I didn't even think about it. Winning the client? Was it winning the customer? What motivated you to keep getting out there, winning the most difficult and the most loyal clients? The reason is, is, is very simple, because it was the right thing to do. Oh, my goodness. It was the right thing to do. Well, I could have not. Let's segue to the next question I want to ask you. Yeah, I could have not worked. Half the, listen, half those pharmaceutical sales guys didn't work. Wow. You have to. All you do is get up. You, you pushed yourself to be a high yeah. achiever. Yeah, I did. I did. I pushed myself and I, you know, and I, I generally worked, you know, till six, seven. Where did you really get your message? Why did you do it? Because it was because, the right thing to do. Because it's the right thing to do. As a Christian, to love. Yeah, as a Christian. And that's the way I was raised. You do the, you do the right thing. So it's the right thing to do as a Christian. That's why yeah. you give up on these people. Right. And so that's why I... That's why I went to see Dr. Knapp at one o'clock in the morning. That's why I kept going to see the other guy because because this company expects me to see these guys. And, and it has nothing to do with whether you can be seen or not because God sees you. So are you telling me it was about honoring your employment contract with your company and doing it to the best of your ability? I wouldn't quite phrase it that way. I would just say I was doing the thing that they hired me to do, and that's what I was supposed to do, and that's why I did it. I see. I see. Well, that's an impressive ethics. So let me ask you first before, um, would you tell the audience what a calling is? Because okay. some people do not know what a calling is. So a lot of people. So launch into your next career. Um, sure. So that was about Teddy's, Teddy uh, Theodore Colbert's career as a salesman, an award-winning salesman. Oh, before I forget, but before I forget, you, you had asked me before we got cut off, you had asked me about the other awards, okay? Every year, you, you had a Rep of the Year award, okay? I won three of those. There, they had, then they had a Business Team of the Year award. That's when you were on the best business team in your whole region. I was on the best business team. So I have one of those. Most of those I still have around here somewhere. Wow. So um, when the Lord called me into ministry, um, I just started going to a Liberty Temple. And um, what a calling is, by the way, is when the, the Lord lets you know that you're supposed to work for him or, or, and, you know, minister for him. They call that a calling. Okay, so um, with me, it was kind of strange because I had just come to Liberty and I had a dream about the Lord telling me that I was supposed to be a minister and preach. Okay, so one day I was at church with, with my apostle, Apostle Turner, and he, he just walked up to me and pointed, pointed at me. He said, he said, Ted, you're called to preach. He just walked up to me and just said it. Right around the same time that I had that dream. Wow. Okay. And from that point on, um, 
it's something that I just like to do. And I, I enjoy preaching. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy ministering. It's fun for me. I like it. Now you had this, this experience, the first calling you had, was it at Northwestern or was it before Northwestern? No, the, the real calling, my real calling, I, I've always been, you know, saying this stuff, but my, my real calling for, for the spiritual stuff didn't happen until I came to Liberty Temple. At, and at Northwestern, I was, do, I was doing more singing, as you remember. You know, I was singing, um, doing a lot of singing with the Northwestern you know, Community Ensemble. But I do remember in other conversations we've had, you know, as friends, I remember you telling me that at Northwestern, you were a devout Christian at Northwestern. Yeah, I was. I was. It influenced the way that you made decisions and the way that you identified yourself from your peers. True. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, about, about sure. how your beliefs made you sure. different from the rest? Sure. Um, at... At, at Northwestern, people were doing all kind of stuff, as you remember, okay? And I, a lot of people thought I was kind of weird because I wasn't drinking, smoking, chasing a bunch of women, all that kind of stuff, because just, it just wasn't like me, okay? And a lot of that had to do with the way I was raised and the Christian ethic that I had. That's why I loved NCE so much, because, you know, most of the people in the choir, I say 90% of us, were really saved. Okay, really love the Lord. Okay, let me let me just interject here. NCE is the Northwestern Community Ensemble. And that is that was the choir, that was the black choir that we had at Northwestern when you and I were there. Yes, thank you. And you were a part of that choir for the whole four years and go on with your story. I just want people to know what NCE is. Yeah, Northwestern, and I was there for years after that. I had graduated, and I sang with the choir. For, <laughs> let me tell you something that's funny. They gave me an award at, from the NCE for being for having been there as long as I, 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 I probably sang another 10 years after I graduated. Wow. They gave me an award they called the Robert Cook Willis Award because I, was, I had done something that nobody had ever done before. I, no, no, nobody had ever stayed there that long. But I loved it. I, I loved the singing. I loved the choir. And I kept singing. I mean, I was like a, I was like, 28, 29 years old, and I was still singing. Wow, yeah. that's beautiful, Theodore. Are any other people taking advantage of that opportunity to, to praise the Lord in a group like that since you've done it? Well, I mean, I mean, most of us praise the, the Lord. People just, just most of us, though, once we graduated, we were through. You know, we weren't, there was no reason. No, I mean, like, I hope you started a trend. Because well, wouldn't it be beautiful if people didn't graduate from... NCE, if they did like you and just kept singing, it would just. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I never thought about that that way, but I guess so. I guess yeah, so. Yeah, voices mellow, voices change. So. Yeah, okay. they do. But then when I went to um, Liberty Temple, and um, that's Liberty Temple Full, full gospel, gospel Church and World and Outreach world Ministries. Outreach Ministries. Right. And that's a church where you are a senior elder. Yes. Yes. Right. And what is yes. a senior elder exactly? Is that we under are, the pastor? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're kind of under the pastor. We uh what I do, you know, different elders do to have different jobs. I'm a preaching elder. Okay, so so I I do a lot of preaching and teaching. Um, I have my apostle thinks very highly of me in that arena. So she now, uses what is an apostle. Now I, I'm okay. asking these questions because I, I know a little bit about the tradition okay. of religion sure. that you're in, but a lot of people really don't. don't know. So when they okay. ask me questions, I try to answer, but your answers are learned answers. So okay. indulge us. Okay. It, the, the Bible talks about the fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They call it the fivefold ministry. Okay? The apostle is at the top. The apostles are the ones that go out and plant churches. They plant churches and they uh, are at the top of the spiritual rung as far as their anointings are concerned. They they plant, you know, they're, they're mainly church planters. And what exactly is an anointing? An anointing, 
the word anointing just deals with the power that God gives you to do what he gives you, what he has you to do. And after the apostles, what's left? Then the next on the rung are the prophets, and you probably know, know about those. Um, they speak, they actually, the concept of the prophet in this time frame is not like it was in the Old Testament, like Isaiah. In the Old Testament, the prophets basically told the future. Okay? Yeah. But in this time frame, the prophet just speaks forth the word of God. Not necessarily telling, speaking the future all the time. Then the next on the wrong is the apostle, prophet, evangelist. The evangelist is just the one that goes out and, and preaches Jesus Christ and him crucified. So I was an evangelist before I became an elder, before I got promoted to, to elder. Um, then there's the pastor, and you know what the pastor is. The, you know, the pastor is the one that runs the church, that sets up the church, etc. And then the teacher, I'm also a teacher, they teach the Bible. And that's what I do also. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. She's taking notes. And that's the five-fold ministry. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. you're welcome. Teddy, you're the author of one book and an upcoming book. Isn't that right? Yes. Um, would, you, would you tell us a little bit? About no deposit, no return. I read that book, yes, and I thought it was a linguistic masterpiece. Thank you. Um, and a I, linguistic you know, masterpiece. I thought, My oh, Lord. Yes, it was very Thank impressive, you. theological. Reminded me a lot of um, the magnificent words. There used to be a guy on television named Gene, someone who would do very deep linguistic studies of, of the biblical words and their Greek origins and how those roots affect meaning and how that meaning should be taken today. And you, uh -huh. do, that, you do that quite a bit in No Deposit, No Return. Um, so you did all this sales stuff, you have all this. What drove you to do that extra mile and become an authority in theology? And in well, something, and in, the, and in the, linguistics is a deep field. You know, I'm all about identifying natural scholars in the wild, you know, amongst us all, because everybody doesn't go to graduate school. But if you were categorized, what you did is a linguistic study, um, and that, that's fascinating. What made you go that extra mile to actually make a book and become an author? And are you a speaker as well? Yes. Well, like I said, I generally send you my YouTube videos, so I'm preaching, you know, regularly. Yes, yes, we'll talk about your, your, your YouTube series, too, where okay. you do the live, um, the live sermons. Mm -hmm. They're so, very exciting as well. I love those. So getting back to what you were saying, um, probably has something to do with my Northwestern background, but... I've always been the type of guy, like I said, I graduated fourth in a class of 425 from high school in, in Cleveland, Ohio. I've always been the kind of guy that wanted to understand stuff. I wanted to know why. Even in, bio, in the biology thing, like when I was selling the pharmaceuticals, I was the guy that would break down the pharmacology and talk to the doctor about how, how the drug actually got in the body and worked. And that's why, what, one of the reasons why, uh, why uh, God had me to be a success was because the doctors were impressed with me being able to talk to them on that level. Now, as far as the Greek and the Hebrew and stuff is concerned, and Letha, they tease me about it all the time. It's and amazing. I mean, in this day and age, I mean, the sign of an educated man in my grandfather's generation was mm -hmm. only Greek and Latin. But that dropped off in the 1970s, 1960s. True. True. What? But you stuck with it. Did you take Greek and Latin in grade no, school? People, people ask me that. But let me, let me tell you very simply why I do the Greek and Hebrew so much. The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. Okay? The New Testament, as we know it, was originally written in Greek. So what you're reading when you read your Bible is a translation. Have you ever heard the terminology, something is lost in the translation? Hey, I, I saw it happen. You know, 
I studied translation too, yes. Okay. Something so what happens is translation. people read the Bible and they think that those words in the Bible are what that uh, is, are what's being said. So because of just the kind of person I am, I like to know. I learned that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek. And there's a big book that's called Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. It has every word in the Old Strong and New Testament. S-T-R-A-W-N? S-T-R-O-N-G-S. It's called the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. It's a big Strong's box. Strong's Exhaustive Concordance? concordance. It, it looks like a telephone book. And what is it? Okay, what it is, it's got every word in the Bible, Old and New Testament, right there, and it has a number next to it. The number next to it is the Greek and or Hebrew word for that. Then, wow. then you go to the back of the concordance at, and look at that number, and it tells you what that word means in the Hebrew if it's Old Testament or what it means in the Greek in the New Testament. And, and, and the Lord has kind of given me a thing for that because... When you look at what the words mean in the originality of the text, many, many times it's nothing like what it looks like when it's translated. So in order for you to really understand the Bible the way the Lord wants us to, you have to be somewhat proficient in the Greek and Hebrew translation. I see. And so because of the way that I am, I'm kind of academically oriented. So when I found out that you needed to, that it's a translation. I said, okay, so that means you got to get into the Greek and Hebrew and you got to know what these words mean. And okay, do you think, what well, was it, did it stem from an oral tradition and, and does it come from Africa, these texts ultimately? I mean, and, and what about the, the fact that Constantinople, his place in history, like, you know, having this accumulation of texts, I mean, uh -huh. You know, you look at it, it's God's word, but, but let me not argue too much about that. I don't want to discuss too much about that because we should have another conversation about that. I okay. would, you know, want to move on to what do you think about the power of prayer? Do you okay. think that prayer is actually an energy and actually affects things? Do you think prayer has power? And how can we pray? Okay. I believe that, I believe that, I believe what the Bible says, okay? The Bible says, I think it's in James 4. I believe it says the, that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, okay? That word availeth, if I remember correctly in the originality of the text, has is the Greek word energio, where we get English word energy from. So there's energy in prayer. No, no, it's the word effectual. That word effectual is, is, is energio. So that means you got powerful energy in your prayer. If you're praying the will of God back to him, there's power in that. Wow. But I know for a fact, just in my life, I've seen God answer prayers. I've seen God answer prayers in my family members' lives. I've seen him do stuff in my life over and over and over and over again. I, we were getting ready to move into our house and um, I didn't have the money for the down payment, okay? Are you crying? Don't cry. No, I'm not crying, I'm not okay. crying, but it's sad. Okay. I know okay. the stress of it, yeah. I so, can't. So what happened is, but I was believing God. I, I, I knew that we, we had looked at the house and I, I, I knew it was, it was ours, but didn't have the money for the down payment. I think it was five days or so before I had to have the money for the down payment. My company at the time, USV, sent me a check for I think it was like, two or three thousand dollars and what they said was i didn't even know it but what they said was i had because of all the time that i had been there i had been involved 
in some kind of a system where money was being taken out of my check. But now, why in the world would they send me the check right when I needed it for the house? Wow, okay, providence. It was God answering prayer. There was no doubt about it. And I've seen that kind of stuff happen over and over and over and over again. Yes, Letha, prayer works. Thank you. I, I tend to agree. Um, um, thank you. So you also teach Sunday school, isn't that right? Yes, I teach. I'm also a member of our Bible college. It's called Logos, L-O-G-O-S, and that means word in, in the Greek. So I, I, I have taught the book of Revelation. I've taught the book of Ephesians. Uh, what else have I taught? I've taught Blacks in the Bible. You like that. Um, I'm trying to remember all the stuff. Uh, I probably taught about and wrote the curricula for maybe 10, 12 uh, of our um, uh, courses in Logos. I was the second Logos teacher. And I'm the only Logos teacher that's still there from when they started. I'm the only wow. one. Are you going to do any touring as a teacher or formalize what you know so other people can learn? Well, I've kind of formalized it already because I was the one that put together all those curricula that I taught. You know, God had me do that. But I do believe that I do a lot on Facebook. You probably see, see some of the stuff. I know you see some of the stuff because you. Oh, you yes. You, you, you are a fervent contributor to Facebook. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of your, your Bible verses. They're very inspirational. Um, but I was also wondering what's your, what's your upcoming book about and what's it, what's it called? Okay. The book that I have coming up now, it's called um, Powers in His Name. That's the name of the book. And I'll tell you what I was doing with that and what the Lord gave me. Um, there's a verse and it goes like this. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in it and it's safe. You said the righteous run in it and are saved? Yeah, are safe. Oh, I see. It's Proverbs 18 and 10. Okay. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in it and are safe. Now, the Lord, it says the name, right? The Lord has a whole bunch of names. Um, we, we call them covenantal names, okay? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Jehovah Sitkanu, the Lord our sanctification. Jehovah um, Elio, the Lord Most High. Okay. Then you have the, um, those are called Jehovistic names. Then you've got the Elohistic names. That's where you use the word El, El, uh, El Shaddai, the God that's more than, than enough. So God has the El names and the Jehovistic names. And what the Lord spoke to me was, He's got all these, he's, he's probably got 25 covenantal names, Jehovah this, El that. And each one of those names, Letha, deals with a specific aspect of his character. The Lord, the provider, the Lord, the healer, et cetera, okay? And what God told me was the Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. God dropped in my spirit that each name that he has, those Jehovistic names is a tower that you can praise and pray your way into. So when you're sick, you praise and praise and pray your way into the Jehovah Jireh, quote unquote, tower or that aspect of his character. Well, tell me this, um, Teddy, that sounds kind of like multiple gods. That sounds like polytheism in a way. Not at all. Or even- It's, it's, nowhere, it's nowhere near it. God. I mean, what, how not. do you explain? Very simply, getting ready to. Okay. God has many different aspects of his character. Those different names, it's all God, but each one of those covenantal names deals with a particular aspect of his character. 
So it's not like each one of those is God. It's all the same God, but it's dealing with a particular aspect of his character. So when so you're you say that an advanced prayer would have to know which God to appeal to, which aspect of God to appeal to when the person is praying, would you say that if you want to be an advanced prayer person, you have to know? I don't think so. I don't think that you have to be that advanced. God is God and he knows where people are. You can just add, pray to, to God to heal you. You know, you don't have to say Jehovah, uh, 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 Rafa, heal me. You don't, no, 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 no. Because most people don't know that. So God knows where we are. So God knows where we are. The main thing I want to make sure that, that we get here, Letha, is we're not talking polytheism. It's one God with different aspects of his character. Okay, I understand. Thank you, Teddy. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about why you're putting up the Facebook, um, the Facebook uh, services. Because what, the reason I'm asking is because, you know, I'm in literature and everything. And one of the things that are repeated as a trope in African American and African diaspora literature, well, not African diaspora, but African American literature, is pastors in African American film. Uh, Paul Robeson played pastors in several uh, Oscar Michaud films. He did. And Ralph Ellison wrote beautiful sermons, and Leon Forrest wrote beautiful sermons. Yep. So the idea of the sermon as an art form, as an authentic African-American cultural art form, is well established in our history. And that's why I'm so excited about your contributions on YouTube, because there are contributions within that tradition that exists of, of the sermon as an artistic form. So would you like to talk a little bit, tell us where on YouTube to find you, what you call, you know, the series? And tell us a little bit about why and how you put that together. That'd be great, Teddy. Thanks. Sure. sure. All you got to do is, is go to you, YouTube and type in Theodore Colbert. That's all you got to do. YouTube, Theodore Colbert, and you'll see probably 30 sermons, 40 sermons. Okay? Why do I do it? The Lord led me to do that because a lot of, some folk don't go to church. A lot of folk don't go to church. Okay? So this is kind of like the little bit that God's given me for the people that might not go to church, but they see my stuff on, on YouTube, on, on Facebook, and so they can get some Bible that way. That's why I do it. Beautiful, yeah. I'm always sympathetic to causes that help shut-ins. Yeah. Know, it's a real problem. And that helps sick, sick and shut-ins, people that can't go to church. You know, sometimes they watch it on, on, um, on television, but some people kind of like the YouTube thing and where they actually see the, see the preacher actually there and preaching. I, I think I got a lot of people who really get encouraged. Now, besides for the YouTube, as you know, I probably post something every day, some, some biblical revelation, something God's given me on, on, on Facebook. Okay. I, I think you do too. I think you do too. And I wanted to talk about, um, now let's go to segue to the third thing. Okay. Um, you are super into, which I'm very excited about. You know, so your career as a salesman, where you distinguished yourself with awards and defining new territories, your work as a senior um, elder in your church, and your work um, that, that, that I want to talk about now, which it just sort of slipped my mind. I went into a panic getting off into that. What, what was it, Teddy? Help me out here. Um. I think you were talking about Facebook. YouTube. Facebook. I got it. I got it. Okay. I had an old lady moment. Sorry. Stop it. I'm in there. I'll see in your moment there. At 62, I'm just not as sharp anymore. But yes, you are. And you don't need 62. No, what you're doing on Facebook is so important. You know, Facebook is going to be around like the encyclopedia. Okay. Angry, it's going angry. to be like an, a, 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 a gold mine of our lives. And you on Facebook, you and lady. Manny have done wonderful things with preserving and promoting and keeping Motown and Philadelphia Sound and all the other pages that you guys maintain and keep flowing with content. It, you must have a full-time job of, of internet content creation. But well, before you what, talk about your Motown site, you've got to talk about Motown. Okay, but before I get into that, I'll, 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 I'll talk about our um, this is this is Black History Month, which I know you are really into, and so am I. 
We yeah. have a page. Have I? Have you looked at our Proud to Be an African American page yet? Proud to Be an African American. I love that page. Okay, that's one of that's our biggest page. I think we got like twenty five thousand people or more. Yeah. Okay. And what we do is we just put the stuff out there, you know, the, the, the historical aspect. And there, are, and there are a lot of things that aren't true that, that people think, and some things that are. And so what we try to do is we just try to um, put up the truth. Like, for example. I really like that. I, you know, you and Black Web does that too. For example, um, what's the guy's name? Okay, Carol Channing. Carol Channing's not a guy. No, I'm, excuse me. I was, I, I was getting ready to go for okay. another person. I was getting ready to go for the guy. And I couldn't remember his name. But, but Teddy, 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 did you know that before Carol oh, Channing died, she admitted she was black? That's where I was going. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Clark Gable and Carol Channing uh -huh. both admitted that they were black. What? Clark Gable? Yes, Clark Gable. I never heard that. It's the truth. And Clark Gable during his time as a as a leading man and all that stuff he was a great advocate for black people because he had black blood himself you know then that was back in the days where they had separate toilets and separate stuff he didn't go for it and he was a you know he was everybody loved him wow and he was, and he was a big advocate he i mean he go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you wow no, no. I'm black. No. <laughs> but, but Teddy, why do you do that? Why do you keep Motown alive like that? Do they pay you? Are you no, on the Motown? No, 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 no. I grew up, I sing a little bit too, okay? I grew up singing. I go, I'm the only child. Mom and daddy would be upstairs asleep. Where did I you grow up? up? What, what town did you grow up in? Cleveland, Ohio. All right, that's right, yeah. Okay. I go downstairs about nine, ten o'clock hey, at night. Did you know Arsenio Hall? Did you know Arsenio Hall? I didn't know him. I mean, I, I found out that he was that he um, lived in Cleveland. There are quite a few people, um, uh, black people, lived in Cleveland. The, oh, what's his, what's his name? Thank you, honey. My daughter's helping me because I'm having senior moments too. Steve Harvey is from Cleveland. Okay, all right, I know. Yeah. Now, and what's really funny. I have a friend named Donnie Shepard who lived a block over from me. And sometimes we go out and play football in the street. And Donnie knew, actually, I didn't even know him, but Steve Harvey went to the same elementary school that I did. Wow. And I played football with Steve Harvey in the street, and I didn't know I was playing football with Steve Harvey in the street. Wow, that's cool. So... Um, but so why do you do it? I mean, I, do you know what a service it is? Do you do it because it's a service? Um, yeah, yeah, I do it because it's a service, and I do it because I like it. Like I said, I nine ten o'clock at night, I get my little uh uh uh, uh phone uh, you know phonograph little little small. Uh, rec record player. What do you mean a phonograph? Okay. Oh, record a, little, player. A, a record player. A, a little small one. I had a little small one about this big. Okay. And I could, and it had a, a handle on it. I could close it up and I could take it. I could you know, carry it around wherever. So I take it into the, into the kitchen. Nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, mom and dad would sleep. And I put on Temptation. I put on, it would be easier to take the wet from water or the dry from sand. So I put that on and oh, I sing it. Hey, your voice is beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. And I sing it. I be down there by myself, nobody but me, singing. Wow. Six, seven, so eight years old with a voice as high as Michael Jackson's. And I was a little boy. Okay. And I just sang. I sang and I sang and I sang. And uh, I was in a couple singing groups. Um, when I was at Northwestern, I don't know whether you heard. Do, I don't know. Do you remember Warren Lawson and Ronald Pitts? 
Of course, I remember Warren Watson and Ronald Pitt. All right. If you remember, the three of us, we were like the three amigos. All right. Okay. We had a singing group, and they called us the OJs, like we were all in jail. <laughs> okay. And I don't know whether you remember, but every year they would have, uh, Northwestern would have what, what they call the nightclub. I remember that. Okay. And every year, Warren, Ronald, and I would perform. And we were, everybody waited to hear us. I think I remember that too. I do. I was the, I was the lead singer. Okay. My goodness. Ward was yes, the hand. You guys had screaming fans. If I, yes, we did. If I remember correctly. It was, it was, it, it was hilarious. <laughs> it was hilarious. People. And we were and very we, excited. It was really beautiful men doing a beautiful thing. And Warren was a ham, so he did the steps. And I remember the first time we came out and did steps, people just hollered and screamed, and it, it was hilarious. Okay. So, um, I've been singing since I was a little kid. And so I'm, I was a big Motown fan. I, I sung those songs to myself. So that's why I'm in the How many hours a week do you spend maintaining this, these websites? I don't, are, I've never really done this. It's, it's gotta be, you know, it's gotta be hours. You know, gotta be two. Do you ever promote them as research sites? Cause you know, wow, if Facebook was searchable. It's, it's wonderful. That's a good idea. I never, I never thought about that. That's, that'd be a great idea because you know, we post a lot of stuff that people don't know about all the time. And I know, it's us, really rich history. And people thank us all the time about the about that stuff. And with, That's with all the lies out in the public about us, with all yeah. those lies, having first-hand proof of accomplishment and achievement becomes so important. And yeah. that hometown sound, that was back when people, like Dozier Hall and Dozier, put so much energy into Lyrics that were heartfelt and beautiful. It was I just did a piece yesterday on Norman Whitfield and Barrett Strong. They wrote a lot of the Temptation stuff, uh, the, the Psychedelic Shack stuff, the uh, Runaway Child, Running Wild. Uh, it was those two guys that, that wrote most of those songs, the Temptation songs, during that era. So and how many hours a week do you think you spend preserving this culture and doing these collections? Maybe seven or eight, maybe more. I don't know. That's lovely. So would you say, Teddy, that that's your hobby? Yeah, that's my hobby. It's, it's definitely, music is my hobby. Music, the Bible, music and the Bible. And I like movies. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big movie buff. Oh, I see. So those are probably my three hobbies. Okay, well, so give us a movie, a movie recommendation. You, well, this one... You, I know you, everybody knows about it. The Black Panther. Oh my goodness. So you liked it? Oh God. And what I'm happy about is it set all kind of records because this was the first superhero movie in history that, it, that has been nominated for an Oscar. I mean, it was an Oscar. Wow. Okay. And this is, you know, people, people this movie and I'm a big comic book fan, too. A big what fan? What fan? Comic, comic book fan. Oh, comic book. Comic book fan. I grew up with the Justice League and, and the X-Men and the Fantastic Four, and I grew up with them, you know, when they were first getting started, because I was a little boy then. So um, I really liked Black Panther because I remember reading about Black Panther when I was a kid, you know, when he first came out. So... And, and the movie just took off because it was, number one, it was excellent, but it drew black people together. Did you notice the great black, what's the word I'm looking for? Pride that was engendered by the Black Panther. Absolutely. People acted like the city that they were in was a real city. They talked about it on Facebook, like, yeah, I'm going to go to, you know, <laughs> it, it was. It's... I think it was a big part of the hashtag Black Girl Magic movie. Yeah, exactly. It really, you know, came in with that. So, you know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, so I do the, fa oh, and so I I'm do the Facebook stuff for two reasons. One, I like for people to know the truth about stuff. And two, I do the, well, probably number one for me even more so. Than the than the more town pages and the Philadelphia pages and the Black Pride pages is I use How it many as pages are you running right now, Teddy? Probably 
We probably got 12, 13. Wow. That's serious business. But the reason why. Okay, we'll have to put a list of them at, in, the, in the notes here. Okay. So um, the reason on. why I'm into Facebook is because it's a, it's a great medium for the word of God. Leah, I cannot go more than a day without posting some kind of Bible, something, something, something that, that God's given me, some Greek, some Hebrew, some what this word means, what that means. If, if I miss a day or two, people tell you, you okay, what's the, I was waiting for you to post something. Wow. Yeah. Constantly, constantly. So my real reason for Facebook is to, is to try and get out the word. Do you Other, have a web page, Teddy? Do you have a web page yet? No, I'm getting ready to have one. Uh, we were talking about that the other day, and uh, one of my best friends that I helped to train is one of the pastors in our uh, in our network, and uh, that's where I'm going next probably, because one of the things that I realized, the book that that, that you were talking about that I showed, I'm going to repackage it, um, get a get a better picture, make it smaller, because the content is good, but people, as my daughter was pointing out to me yesterday, and she was so right. Um, people are attracted by the way things look. So I'm going to make this book the size that a book should be smaller because I want it to be smaller, but the way they, when I set it up with the company, they made it come out looking more like a workbook. Okay. So I'm going to get some people. Are you to release me. another edition of, um, of your first book? I don't know. Copy, be called no, another. Deposit, no return. I yeah. have a copy of no deposit, no return. I know. I know I sent it to you, you asked for it. So uh, what I'm gonna do is it's, it's gonna be the same content, but I'm gonna repackage it. I see, yeah. I see. It's gonna be a you know, the, the, the measures of the book are gonna be like a like a normal book. Now and, how do you want people to use that book, Teddy? Well, I tell you some things that people have told me I didn't even think about. I have had several people come to me and say, Teddy, I use that book as my devotional. I've heard people say every day I go in there and I read, you know, from the next, from, from the last thing that I read to, the, to where you are now in the book. And they use that as their prayer and their Bible study. Wow. So they use that as their spiritual inspiration for the day? Yeah. Yeah. I, and I wasn't even thinking about that, but a, a, a bunch of people have come to me and told me that. Yeah. My, my experience reading it was like that too. Like I would read a section and it would be so profound and thought provoking that I would have to just stop and muse about that, you know, let it sort of sink in and, and become analyzed. So mm -hmm. I agree that they are deep meditationals. So, so like I said, I'm gonna... Um, Repackage it to put it in a different size. Right. Are you, and, are you gonna stay with and something? The cover, and the it? cover is gonna be more, no deposit, no return. I'm, I'm gonna get an artist or something that, you know, cause it, my, my daughter was so right. You know, there's nothing, you know, I was just kind of going the cheap route because I'd never written a book before. And I found uh, uh, a company called uh, uh, Create Space where you can really get a, get a book published for a very inexpensive amount of money. But um, like this book here, I think it, it, could, it could sell thousands and thousands if it was packaged right and I had done some some book signings and that type of stuff so that's what that's what i'm getting ready to get into now oh yeah the marketing that's is like everything it. yeah because yeah. I, I didn't market it at i didn't market it at all though i sold about almost 400 books but they were all people that knew me wow that's so impressive that that sales is wonderful but it's not well, really Teddy, impressive to, um what it's, it's, it's not really that impressive because if i marketed it i probably could have sold twenty thousand books yeah, but I didn't you, you, just said take, you just said you're going to take all those lessons and apply them to your second edition. Plenty yeah. about to do a second edition, so we live. Well, I'm not really going to call it a second edition. It's going to be the same book, but I'm just going to repackage it. Why did you want to become an author? You'd already achieved. Why? Why push that extra mile? What did you want out of being an author? And are it's, you doing it yet? This is one of those things. This is one of those things where it, it was the Lord. When I started, when I got to ministry, and I found out about the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and what the words that the uh, Old New Testament was written in Hebrew and Greek, respectively, 
it kind of drove me crazy. I'm like, what? And so then so I started studying. I'm a studier, okay? So I started studying, and I started studying what these names really, really mean, and these words really mean. And so when I started doing that, I kind of, I, um, it really started off people that knew me and looked at the Facebook stuff and, and, and the stuff that I post on Facebook, the biblical stuff, they were the ones. For years, people like, Teddy, when are you going to write a book? Come on, look at all this stuff you always put on Facebook. You need to write a book. So people have been on, on me to write a book for years. So that's part of the reason. And, and the Holy Ghost, um, you know, like with the Greek and Hebrew and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's something that the Lord gave me. So that's why. Thank you. Well, you know, there, there are so many other things we could talk about, but we probably have come up against time. You know, people have a fleeting attention, but this is a wonderful chance for me to ask you one last question, I think. Well, some others might come. And it's about literacy. Mm -hmm. you, know, you talk about how you're driven to know why and to understand the language and, and, and you're a studier, all these, these, are these inherent characteristics? So I'm gonna work my way up to my question. Are these inherent characteristics or are these characteristics that people can cultivate to have more success in their lives? I think for sure that people can cultivate them, but with me, it's just something that got put in me. Okay. My other question, literacy is one of my big causes. How important is the ability to read and write independently at a high level of competence to living a satisfying life? It is at the apex of that, Letha. You have to be literate. You have to be able to communicate. It is imperative. There are a lot of people, um, that never got the education. My father only went to the third grade, okay? So he never got a chance to become literate. And a lot of people that grew up in his time didn't, didn't get a chance to even go to school like we did, okay? Did they value education anyway? Oh, yeah. Such a my father, culture, I mean. My father yeah. and my mother both valued education. Here, this is something that my father said. This will make you laugh. Now, when I was little, speaking of literacy, my father would take me with him to the grocery store around the corner. And I would be in the basket, because I was little, and he had, and, I, and I'd go past Sugar Frosted Flakes or something, and I'd take it and put it in the basket. I was like five months, six months, something like that, okay? And I could talk, okay? And wait, are you saying that you could talk and reach for stereo and you were a five month old baby? Five or, five or six or something like that, between five and seven months. Oh That's my God. Think. Wait, Teddy, do you also remember doing that? Yeah, I do. Oh my I God, remember. I totally believe you. I, I remember. totally believe you. Listen, so the, the, the one thing that really makes me remember was one time uh, I came, we, my father was getting ready to pay for his groceries and there was all this stuff in there that I put in there. <laughs> And he said, boy, he said, we put all this stuff in there. I said, yeah. <laughs> and then he said, and then I said, yes, that's, that's so cute. That's adorable. And then I said, yes, those are sugar frosted flakes. Wow. And my dad said, wow. and my dad said, boy, you can't read. I said, that's sugar for S U G A. Wow. Okay. He came home, told all, told all the family, everybody got scared because he back in those days, they said that if you were too smart, you wouldn't live long. Yeah. That was really I don't know whether he ever heard that or not. So they were thinking I wasn't going to make no, it. No, I didn't hear it. Teddy, I lived it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they thought I was going to die. They really thought I was going to die. Oh my God. They thought that the, because they thought I was too, I was too smart. going to kill you because you get out of your place, huh? No, you, you would no, be happy sleeping no, on the snow. <laughs> we no, what they were saying was it was something biological. It, this was an old adage from down south. There was something biological that when you were real smart like that, too young, you weren't gonna you weren't gonna live long. It was because uppity Negroes got axed. 
<laughs> well, in what on my end of it, they were saying it, it, that there, there was something in like your brain or something that when you were too intelligent and you're too young that you, that you weren't going to live. Not from somebody killing you, but there was something biological that they were saying that you weren't going to live because you were too smart. How did you feel about having that put on you? Well, I mean, I, I thought that they were silly. You know, I didn't think that. But, 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 that. but it must have affected you somehow, do you think? Well, what it did... All it did really with me, Lisa, was as I as I was growing up, I've always been a studier. Okay. So like I tell you, I graduated fourth in the class of 425. So I um I didn't know it, but I have a cousin who's very, very bright. A young lady too. She's I think she's got her PhD. My cousin Patrice. And I tell you, I went to Collinwood High School, and that's where they sent all the supposedly really, really bright black kids. We had to catch buses, okay? So my cousin Patrice is very, very bright, too. They bust her into Collinwood. Behind me, she's seven years younger than I am. Letha, I had no idea. Patrice told me, and then a couple of other people that went to school with me who, uh, one of my friends, Sharita, uh, wound up being a principal of another school. Okay. And, and first my cousin, then Sharita told me, and I still can't believe it. Patrice said, I had a teacher in high school. Her name was Miss Kruger, my English teacher. Okay. And she always liked me and thought very highly of me, thought I was real smart and all that kind of stuff. Well, it just so happens that Patrice wound up taking Miss Kruger too. And she pulled me aside one day and she said, oh, Miss Kruger, Miss, somehow or another Miss Kruger found out that I'm your first cousin. And she said, all she talks about, this was like, like I said, I'm seven years older than she is. Wow. I've been wrong. I, 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 finished, I finished Northwestern, okay? And she said, all Miss Kruger talks about was how you are one of the most brilliant students that ever, that ever, that she ever taught at Collinwood. And I started crying. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, I mean, I, okay, I did real well, yeah, but I didn't think it was a, like something like that, like historical stuff. Well, that's because you're inside, you know, that's because you're inside yourself. I think a lot of people who have done really great things like you that have achieved and then continue to achieve and achieve and achieve. I think a lot of people like that are so inside themselves, they don't realize how amazing they can be to, to other people and what a wonderful inspiration um, people such as yourself are to a lot of people. Well, I wanted to thank you for choosing me because I didn't think there was anything to me for you to do something like this. Oh my goodness. Well, I think you distinguish yourself as a religious leader for one. Um, is, is your church very big and, and you're there every Sunday? Every Sunday. Uh, and we have Bible study on Wednesday. I'm there all the time. It, there was a time when the church had like 10,000 people. Wow. Is that a mega church or not? Well, it was. Originally it was, you know, but then things started, started changing. People just didn't want to go to church anymore like, like they used to. But when I first came there, like in the 80s, is, is that why you do the YouTube and the Facebook outreach programs? Well, not necessarily. Well, yeah, I guess, I, guess, I guess that you could say that, yeah, because people aren't going to church like they did 20 years ago. A lot of people are, particularly a lot of the, um, you know, like us in the boomer time, but, you know, but a lot of the, you know, people in their 20s and 30s, uh, younger people have their own ideas about the Bible and religion, all that type of stuff. So what I try to do is I just put stuff on my Facebook page uh, about things biblically, historically, what the words mean, all that kind of stuff. And what it does is it gets people interested. And once again, I had no idea that so many people are waiting every day for me to post something on Facebook, you know, biblically oriented. Wow, you know, that, that makes me think that we are in such an age of transition that now that we have digital technologies changing things, 
we have to find new ways to reach out to each other and form communities and, and make these cyberspace communities. So it occurs to me that you're also a leader in bringing the black church online and, and into, the, into the mainstream as, as a recruiter. Uh, maybe recruiter is not the right word, but I, evangelical. I mean, it's sort of a cyberspace evangelical. Oh, yeah. Well, one of the things I, I want to let you know is that most of your churches, a lot of your churches, your larger churches, they're on, they're, they uh, stream. So you don't have to go. You can just stream on your computer or whatever. Like, like for example, um, a lot of people can't make it, members, like if they can't make it because of their job or whatever, they'll just, they'll just stream Liberty and watch, and watch my apostle preach or whatever. I see. Yeah, I've used it instead of church before myself. So, um, but like what I do, a lot of what I do is, is like the Lord kind of prompts me to, but the people um, like my way of with the Greek and Hebrew and the historical stuff. People like it. So, so tell me what's next for you. Um, what's your next goal? Is it your next book? Yeah. Okay, wait I, a minute. One more thing about your church. Are, are people welcome to go there? Sure. Anybody can come. Are you interested in new members ever? Oh, yeah. boy, are we. Yeah. Liberty Temple, Full Gospel Church, and, and World Outreach Ministries. Ministries. The That's address is 22. Illinois, right? It's in Chicago. The address is 22. 33, 2233 West 79th Street. 2233 West 79th Street. Yeah, if you want a church that's going to teach you the Bible, that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit, it's a good one. All right. And I've heard the, some of the congregants uh, in the background in the YouTubes, and they sound like a very friendly, they are. They are. bunch of people. They are like a, a lot of people that would be very comfortable to be with. They are, and they're very encouraging to, to me. They always have have a kind word. Uh, okay, I gotta ask you just one more question. Did you read James Baldwin's "Go Tell It on the Mountain"? Yep, it, it was How a long time. Accurate was it? And did you, did it resonate with you as a person who got the call? Um, yeah. As a, oh yeah, yeah, man, yeah. And a yeah, person definitely. who grew up in that tradition. Talk to definitely. me a little bit about how James Baldwin's Go tell it on the mountain reflects reality. Well, that was a that was a long time ago, but basically, what I get is you have to get the word out. It has to be done, okay. And people with calls on our lives—that's the burning thing inside of us. We, we we want people to know the truth. You can't make a person get saved. You can't make a person do anything, but you can present the Bible and the gospel in such a way that it's interesting. One of the things that, one of my callings with what I do is I like it, I like uh, to share things with people that they didn't know. A lot of people tell me I motivate them because I'm always telling them stuff that they didn't know, they never heard before, you know, biblically speaking. So that's one of the things I enjoy doing is sharing something that people didn't know. And they, so they're learning. So that's one of the most important things for me. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with me today, Teddy. Thank you for choosing me. Let me tell you somebody that I think you probably, he might be on your, in, on your list. Contact Warren Lawson. Okay. He's, a, he's done wonderful things. Okay, thank you. Because I, so you I need am to really talk to him. You definitely need to talk to him. Getting to more people. Um, I, I have Donnie Tucker. Uh-huh. And Carl Douglas lined yeah. up. Um, so I did a one with Carl, and mm -hmm. I, I have one set up with Dottie Tucker. So I will definitely put Warren on the list. Is yeah. there anyone else that I should take note of? Because I really think this is a wonderful opportunity. We get so maligned in the media, and we really need to come forward with our own stories. And we have so many triumphant stories like yours, and, and Dottie's, and Carl's, and Jeffrey's, and, I'm sure the list goes on and on. So thank you what so am I much. Doing? I'm going to take some time and think about it. I'm sure I'll come up with some people and I'll just... Uh, well, everybody's been so nice about Facebook. All right, I'll look forward to you doing that. And I will eventually give my book to you when I know... All right, thank you. Now, there was one other thing I wanted to ask you. So are you going to put this 
on on um YouTube. How you what? Are, what yes. You know, what are you do? Yes. If you do, be- let me know because I like to have access to it because I got a whole bunch of unsaved cousins. It's going like to be to. a YouTube. It's going to be a YouTube series. Okay. I've used one already. You know, I'm I'm going to be releasing them probably as a set. Okay. Excellent. Also, I'm also going to donate them because I don't use all the footage. Mm-hmm. I've, I've had some blooper moments. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, so I don't use them all. So I'm going to donate the rest of the original tapes to Jeffrey's archive at Northwestern. Excellent. Uh, okay. Yeah. Excellent. So, so I'm going to be sure that, that there are enough copies of this out there and original archival copies for the legacy to last. So and when we look was- back on the African American people, it's not just about you know, being murdered in the street by police exactly. and, and vigilantes. But yes. it's also about the long, hard, painful, beautiful struggle that we, in my generation, in our generation, have taken uh, to, to achieve great things. I agree. Thank you. And you did a great job in articulating and setting this up. It's it very impressive. The reason why I asked about what, what you were going to do with this is because somebody like me, you know, a little boy from Cleveland, um, with a very strong will mom uh, and a very sweet dad. But, you know, I went through riots at Collinwood High School. I was chased by very angry Italians, you know, three or four times. And the reason why I'm asking is because maybe somebody might get encouraged by this video and my story. Well, that is, that, that is our dearest hope. Uh, we not only look for people to be encouraged, But we have a lot of people teaching African-American studies who have no connection to the African-American community. And they rely upon these firsthand accounts to to inform them about their scholarship. So it's a very important tool for scholars to have a very important, uh, you know, a goal mine of information. You know, and you represent the field of religion, but also sales, which, you know, that's like mastery of the material and the spiritual world. Um, And yes, people need to have markers, need to know, because you know how it is you're coming along. And if you don't see anybody like you, you you question a little bit what it is. Why do I feel so different? Why Mm -hmm. do I believe in my difference so intensely? You know, why do I know I'm special and great? And you just keep moving, moving, moving. Well, people coming behind need to see people like you as milestone markers to okay. say, yes, I can go this far and farther. Yes, I can go this far. It's like testing the depth of the ocean or something. Amen. Thank you, Letha. I appreciate it. And like Thank I said, you, I'm, I'm honored that you chose me to be in, in, in your series. Thank well, you very you much. You were a very easy pick. We've been friends for a long time, had many wonderful conversations, and you have been there for me when no one else was, with beautiful words of, of love and inspiration. So thanks, Teddy. God bless you. Thank All you. right, you too. Bye. Okay, Shaman, you can turn it off.